Hi, I'm Richard Doyle. I'm a Edwin Earl Sparks professor of English at Penn State University. Uh, Edwin Earl Sparks was a really cool guy, actually. He was responsible for uh, getting the Gettysburg Address, sort of putting it into volumes and so forth. But uh, I teach classes and I write books, and they seem to help people. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been teaching meditation here on campus in different locations for I think eight years now, uh, maybe longer. We just practice um, learning how to engage in what Buddhism calls mind training. Practice teaching the mind how to first, for example, just focus on the breath, how to experience, like, so for example, you could do this right now, you say you've never meditated before. Yeah. Um, but you can probably close your eyes right now and just observe whatever thoughts come into your mind, right? You can do that, right? So um, I just thought I'm to make clear that the meditation comes out of it's a kind of non-denominational secular practice that I started doing back in 1997. I started meditating out of the experience of um, trying to reconstruct myself after losing uh, my mother to sudden death. I just felt so awful. I was just trying to find anything that would make me feel better. And I kind of non-consciously started learning how to meditate. Um, so when I would talk about this a little bit, so, you know, and I would work with biblical passages uh, in the class, and I was saying, look, you think that this book is all about teaching you that you have to believe in something, but that's not really yeah. what it's about. This book has a series of practices to help you reflect. Because it's one thing to say, oh, well, we have to reflect. And it's hard to find techniques to help you do it well, right? So um, it grew out of that, and then I've been teaching that Bible as Lit class now for, I think, seven or eight years, maybe nine. And the way I teach Intro to the Bible as Literature is uh, the Bible from a non-dual perspective, meaning that um, it's my hypothesis, and I just wrote a book about this, uh, and um, that the Bible uh, is like every other mystical scriptural tradition, has recipes in it for how to turn your mind towards itself so that you can experience altered states of consciousness because it's healthy for human beings to experience altered states of consciousness when they no longer experience themselves as a localized self. They don't feel this sense of I, me, mine. Right. Which in contemporary reality we think is who we are. I, me, or mine. Whereas Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, the use of psychedelics, these things all nudge us into places where we have experiences that we're not fundamentally experiencing the world in terms of I, me, and mine, where we see that I, me, and mine is like a lens through which we see the world, but it's not who we are. There are both parts that a kind of Western spiritual materialist perspective can take seriously the content of their own minds. Mm -hmm. So we're trained endlessly in how to be rigorous about manipulating the external world, but we learn less than, noth less than nothing about how to, what are techniques for introspection. Yeah. It, we're not taught. No. We're barely taught really how to attentively read anymore. We're taught how to extract information, but we're not taught how to contemplate a text. I have to start from the beginning in every kind of class that I teach about text about how to read. It's like slow down. We, we did one line of the Diamond Sutra today in my intro Buddhism class. It's, you know, it's 22 pages long, single space. We did one line. And it says, Om Nama Bhagavatye Arya Prajna Paramitye. And it just means uh, homage to the highest holy perfection of wisdom. That's all it means. But we worked with that very slowly, and I think we got a whole lot out of it. But it's because we're saying, like, okay, but like, cut to the yeah. chase. Like, yeah. who's doing the doing? What's being done? You know, what's the main idea of the paragraph? I need to get this right on the PSSAs, right? Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's... It's terrible what we're doing to our imaginations and to uh, our capacities to think. So this is part of just trying to sm play a small role in undoing some of that. Through a series of remarkable coincidences, I got funded by NPR to go down to really? uh, uh, Peru and record... Uh, an audio documentary about ayahuasca tourism, because the other word for yahe is ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And it was my job, I literally have the contract somewhere, and it says that I'm supposed to go down there and trip balls. <laughs> and I, did, I ne never heard that phrase before. 
but I knew what it meant when it said it, right? So I was like, I am the smartest person in the world and I'm getting paid to go down there and, uh, and to take drugs, even though I'm not like a big drug person. And so I went down there and I drank ayahuasca and the joke was on me because first of all, the first night was like the most difficult thing that I'd ever experienced, a night of like intense reckoning with myself, a kind of like a cosmic mirroring of myself uh, that was uh, extremely difficult, but also very healing. Like, you, like if you can imagine, you know, like three thousand hours of, of intensive therapy, you know, in one night. Um, and then the next morning, I got up to um, uh, record some more because we were recording, making uh, ayahuasca down by the river. We were making ayahuasca. We were pounding the vine down by the river putting it into this big pot with the person who would then later become my teacher, Norma. And, uh, and she said, tonight, she said in Spanish, she said, tonight you will once again drink ayahuasca. And I was like, no, 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 no. Because I hadn't slept in days. And, and she's just like, no, you must have courage. And I, and I said, I don't have any courage. <laughs> you know, like, uh, don't make me. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you used all my courage up last yeah. night. And, um, and she said, I, and she said, okay, well, when I go back to my, uh, 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 lab at the uh, University of Peru, I'll make you some uh, uh, capsules that to treat the rest of your asthma. And I started crying because I hadn't said anything about my asthma. And I had to go off all my asthma medication before going down there to do this uh, yeah. experience. And I grew up in and out of hospitals and in oxygen tent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was like very much a part of who I was. And the fact that she was kind of caring for me in this context was really overwhelming, to be honest with you. And so two days later, I was out on the Amazon with her, and I said that that night I was going to, I wanted to drink ayahuasca again to, uh, to focus on my asthma. And she gave me a high five. She was wearing a Telefunken soccer jersey, uh, and she's a mestiza woman who'd been, uh, at that point was in her 60s, and she would, had uh, been healing people in the jungle for since she was 12, and she uh, experienced self-healing of tuberculosis. Um, and that night I drank ayahuasca, and um, it was an ex interesting experience that I wrote about. And uh, my asthma uh, was right away at a much, 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 much clearer, clearer, clearer level than it had ever been. And then I threw out my inhaler. And uh, I just got started, I, I started, you know, I started, when I got back, I kept doing the lap swimming that I started in 1997 after my mother died, doing that, biking and so forth, and now, you know, knock wood, I haven't had, uh, I'm basically healed of asthma and also a whole, whole body eczema that I used to have, that I still have the scar tissue of, you can probably see there's like a one, it's like a one wow. right yeah. there, um, but it was all over my whole body, but um, through ayahuasca, um, I was able to um, be healed of these things. And so my scientific materialist mind, which, you know, when I went to Peru, I was secular. When I came back from Peru, I was not. And uh, my whole worldview just went poof. Because in order for that to happen, then a lot of the things that I thought were true about the world, kind of fundamental truths about the world, like the world is nothing but matter and so forth, have to be wrong. And actually, the very, I never forget that the first day after I drank ayahuasca the first time, I was embarrassed of my PhD, because I was embarrassed at like the pretense of knowledge that I had, uh, when in fact I saw that this, what I had just experienced was so much more remarkable and profound uh, than anything that I had studied, or anything that I could ever know, that like I, you know, humbled myself before this woman who was an amazing teacher. So, um, you know, once that occurred, so I both looked outward into the world to try to read everything, like in the world, that would try to explain to me how this had happened, uh, to come up with some kind of a rational point of view on how I could have been healed in this way. When I, like, went to the best doctors and everything, you know, when I was a kid, like I told you, and nothing helped. And, um, but as a part of that, too, I kept meditating, and even, like, when I was waiting to drink the ayahuasca, I meditated before I drank the ayahuasca. So I kept uh, meditating, and in meditating, it kind of stabilized my experience to understand how my body-mind could interact in that way. I got enough experiences out of the, I 
think, six to eight times that I drank ayahuasca that I would never have to do it again. Mm. But I'm not ruling it out. <laughs> and what I would say is, is that meditation experience is so much more profound than any psychedelic experience that I ever had that I don't find myself looking to take psychedelics now. I feel like we're all on the journey that we're on. We're all on our own path, so I'm not going to look back and say, oh, gosh, I wish I would have of course, yeah. started meditating when I was 23 or something. But I wish I'd started meditating when I was 23 or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, totally. in other words, there's a lot of unnecessary suffering totally. that you don't need to go through. And it does seem that people are getting it quicker. But speaking for myself, I'll say, I think I needed to really suffer a lot in order to see that I needed to take countermeasures and heal myself and not just accept the situation as right. it was. So I wouldn't change a thing. On the other hand, I want to share kind of, you know, meditative practices, introspective practices with people uh, as early as possible. Uh, and I don't think that there's any uh, um, barrier towards people taking it on at a very young age. You know, I had to come through it to the whatever way I had to come through it, but that doesn't mean anybody else has to come through it that way. We never spend a single moment outside of subjectivity, ever, our entire lives. Not once. So it's not lacking anything at all. Okay. Objectivity is a way of working with the world that allows us to model the world, that allows us to act on it in ways. But it needs to be paired with the capacity to introspect, the capacity to exper experience what it means to live subjectively, because that's how we live, is mm -hmm. subjectively. And even when, if you write this down, people are going to see the word subjective and they're going to think that I mean absence of ob objectivity. That's not what I mean. Experience the world as it worlds itself to you. Uh, and then you're going to be able to evaluate all this so-called objective knowledge. So if you spin that all out, you can see like, okay, people are unhappy. And instead of saying, hey, maybe there's something deeply wrong with the foundation of our culture. <laughs> say, <laughs> maybe we can use some of the dross that we generate in this culture. That, Let's make a different shape of molecule. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then so we say we try to find the right shape of molecule to get in there and block the molecule that we don't like, right? Serotonin agonism, right? Um, and we say, yay, we're going to make everybody happy. And it's saying, well, it looks like serotonin <laughs> reuptake inhibitors aren't really any more effective than placebo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we construct an entire worldview where it understands what is real as material, right? And then, and then we add in what is real is like that which we can connect to, you know, the generation of economic value. And so you're going to have this machine that is going to endlessly generate new things to try to make you happy when it's the existence of the machine that's making you unhappy in the first mm -hmm. place. So we have to go after the foundations. And what's beautiful about it is we can go to the foundation. The foundation is this false view of being I, me, mine. And just relaxing a little bit into the fact that, you're, that you don't need to identify with your thoughts. You don't need to identify with your feelings. You can learn how to observe your thoughts and observe your feelings and engage in healing feedback loops so that you're happier. You're self-tuning, metaprogramming, you know, biologically self-aware system. Why not heal yourself? Like humans are self-healing, the self-healing species. Why wouldn't we do it? Well, the answer is because people are making money and we have a cultural framework that understands, oh, if you want to be healed, you need to go to somebody else. Yeah, of course. Now, it's very true that if I want to get my legs set, I'm going to go to somebody else. <laughs> but in terms of a lot of the things that are ailing us, we have to do it ourselves. Yeah. Because they convinced that that way madness lies. Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's the exact opposite that's true. You know, at least depression, anxiety, neurosis is in the direction of believing in the I, me, mind. Because you're putting yourself in an impossible situation. But, and, and so if you can release that, health is on the other end of it.